All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for putting together this most impressive meeting. Uh, so I'd like to talk about some work, uh, two, 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 public, two papers which appeared last year. So the main focus is, in some sense, on how important is the uh, distribution of couplings for uh, what you see in spin glass systems. Um, well, I mean, in this audience, I don't really need to say what is a spin glass, but I normally need to say uh, in most talks, uh, but you might not be aware that, uh, you know, in layman's terms, uh, there's a different definition of a spin glass, uh, which uh, many of you might not have seen, um, and which maybe we can uh, kind of study uh, in, the, in the dinner times. Uh, interestingly, so that you can buy this, but it's apparently kind of quite uh, uh, in demand, uh, so this type of spin glass is even sold out. Okay, but that just as a side remark. So I'm looking at the standard Edwards Anderson model, and I want to understand uh, in particular, you know, what happens for these different types of coupling distributions, um, and in particular understand, uh, you know, about universality. So for the 2D case, for example, people have looked at, um, at this, also in 3D, of course, but for the 2D case, people have looked at this, and so if you do it naively, it seems like the behavior is quite different. I mean, in the bimodal case, you have a large degeneracy of the ground state, and uh, so you might be tempted to assume that uh, because of that, so these are just some observations here that uh, there's a different behavior. I mean, there's a big body of literature on that, which I don't cover here, so I think the basic semi-consensus is that at finite temperatures you recover universality. Also, there are some people who don't believe that. But in fact, I will be focusing on zero temperature. And there, clearly, there is a difference because uh, you know, if you have a continuous distribution of couplings, you have a unique ground state or you know, a unique pair of ground states. Whereas if you have a, a bimodal distribution, then you have many ground states. And in particular, uh, in fact, you can, you can convince yourself that there is uh, an extensive ground state entropy. So, um, yes? Could you consider by modern distribution, but by thick, instead of being two delta functions? You mean, yes, well, that's of course what people did, uh, you know, uh, your, your co workers did for the uh, random field ising problem. Um, then the degeneracy, in, a, in an exact sense, would go away. And uh, that would be a slightly different situation. But uh, I mean, that's a, a valid question. You know, would that go to the same limit at finite temperatures? Uh, I mean, that would be the hope. Let's put it like that. But I, I will focus here on the case of having exact delta peaks, if you want to call them like that. OK, so you, you know, of course, in, in, you know, there's a different bet difference between two and, and, and at higher dimensions and two dimensions. If you look at the phase diagram, we don't expect spin glass phase at finite temperatures, but in, in three and higher dimensions we do. So let's focus on the 2D case uh, first. And so if you look at the zero temperature behavior, we have this difference between unique ground state or unique ground state pair and exponentially many ground state. And as a consequence of that, if you look at the excitations, they also behave differently. So if you look at the stiffness exponent, that seems to be different. Uh, domain wall fractal dimensions, we are not quite sure because there is no real estimate, reliable estimate for the bimodal case. Um, and so the first task here is to, what would we like to do? We would, be, uh, would like to be able to determine ground states uh, for large systems to get uh, kind of a good control of the finite size corrections. And also we would like to, for the case of, of the bimodal model, uh, sample the degenerate ground states uh, with the right weight. And the right weight is, you know, sample each ground state with the same weight, a uniform distribution, which is not what comes out of these uh, algorithms. Yeah? So in the bimodal case, there are spins which have zero external field. So you can see the dynamics of the without energy cost. Right, right. So I will talk about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the good thing of other, I mean, there are configurations which are reachable using these dynamics. Right. So in the thermodynamic sense, you should do average over all those configurations. If you are thinking yes. about uh, uh, Absolutely. So for the, for the case with degeneracies, I need to average over all these yes. configurations that can be reached by overturning clusters or individual free spins. Yeah. So you are not going to talk about that? I will, I will do. Yes, I will talk about that. Yeah. Right. 
Okay, and so uh, kind of the approach is similar to what I think many of you know um, from, from some older work. So it's mapping the problem onto a minimum weight perfect matching problem, so a problem which is known in graph theory, but the mapping we use is slightly different from the kind of old mapping that was used previously. So this was first, I think, cooked up by uh, Creighton Thomas and Alan Middleton and Pardella and Leas independently about 10 years ago. Um, and the main point is that this mapping is kind of computationally more efficient because it maps to a graph which is not fully connected. The old mapping had a fully connected graph of frustrate duplicates. Here it's a sparse graph that you end up with and thereby you can actually look at much larger system sizes. So the space complexity is just linear in the volume. Also we can use, again that's a technical point, we can use some kind of windowing technique to treat systems with fully periodic boundary conditions which people couldn't uh, you could, couldn't look at before because the mapping in itself is only valid for the case of planar graphs. So that's an illustration of this uh, process for getting rid of excitations for fully periodic boundaries. So that allows us to really go to large system sizes up to 10,000 times 10,000. So if you look at what you can do, for example, in Monte Carlo or you mostly, uh, most people considered previously in uh, in ground state calculations, that's, uh, that's a reasonably big step. And so the hope is that <coughs> This tells us, uh, you, know, you know, that gives us better control of the finite size correction. So the quantities we looked at are related to these uh, excitations that you see if you change the boundary conditions. So we have a setup like is shown down here. We, we look at the system with periodic boundary conditions, at least in one direction, maybe open in the other direction if it's for, for the planar setup or periodic in both directions. Compute a ground state and then we compute a ground state after inverting all the bonds that cross one of the edges uh, and then look at the energy difference and at the ex excitation uh, that is uh, incurred by that. And so you know that uh, you know, this, this defines the, uh, the stiffness of the system. So there's a spin stiffness exponent, which uh, for the 2D model should be related also to the uh, correlation length exponent like this. Okay, let's look at some of the results. First, we can check um, uh, what does the ground state energy do? So uh, you see that uh, you know, up to the system sizes that uh, one could look at previously, there are you know, significant um, corrections. Of course, we need to take into account scaling corrections. I mean, this is for a system which has, which is indicated down here, periodic boundary conditions in one direction, free boundaries in the other direction. So we expect some kind of edge effects here, which we need to take into account in doing the fits. And so we convince ourselves that this is a good uh, a good scaling ansatz, and uh, so we get uh, pretty good results from that. Then let's look at the defect energy. Uh, this uh, should decay because we expect a negative stiffness exponent. Um, and again, you know, taking scaling corrections into account, we get some stiffness exponent up to something like four uh, significant figures. Uh, again, for the same type of boundary conditions. And then also we, we can look at the fractal dimension of these objects. Um, uh, and that's what you find here. Then we repeated the whole calculation also for this other type of boundary conditions uh, where uh, we can go to only slightly smaller system sizes, but you see that you know, those results are perfectly compatible with the two types of boundary conditions, which is of course what we, what we hope. Um, and then, so we looked at uh, the following relation, which was uh, proposed um, a while ago now by uh, uh, Mike Moore, who is here, uh, and uh, Alex Hartmann and, uh, and Amoruso, and uh, so they looked at um, SLE properties of, of these domain walls, and if you um, accept that these are described by SLE, you can infer from numerics the central charge, then you can look at the cuts table for the central charge, assuming that it's a conformal minimal model, which is of course... Uh, well, it's not one of the standard SLEs, but you can uh, check that it scales like an SLE with some kind of kappa, which is a fractional number. I mean which is not close to, I mean, not obviously close to a rational number, let's put it like that. And then, you know, if you look at that cuts table, you can pick the way that seems to be close to the uh, fractal dimension. And so, so that gives you that relation, uh, which, you know, looked to be satisfied with the precision that was available at the time. But if you look at these higher precision results, uh, uh, those are not compatible, in fact. Uh, where, you know, they are, there's like a um, 20 sigma deviation between them. So uh, that doesn't seem to hold. Then the second problem is for the uh, case of the bimodal system, right? I mean, this was the Gaussian case, so what about the bimodal? Uh, there we have the problem that um, uh, 
this combinatorial optimization algorithm, it doesn't give you all of those ground states with the same weight. So if you, in fact, if you look, so this is for one sample, which has of the order of 12,000 different ground states, so it's a very small sample. Um, and then you just check, you know, how often do you find each of those ground states? You make a histogram. If you do something which is just, you know, adding some noise each time you do the calculation in the hope that it gives you a different ground state each time, uh, it's far from uniform. You, you find some of the, you know, many of the ground states you never find, at least within, you know, the, those limits. And, uh, you know, some other ground states you find extremely often. So this is not uniform sampling. So we have to do something to, to turn that non-stochastic algorithm into an algorithm that allows us to sample uniformly. And I, I don't have time to explain that uh, in detail, but um, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I think this is uh, very small. It's maybe 10 squared or something like that, because the number of ground states blows up uh, exponentially, of course, and so uh, it is a very small sample. So uh, relating to your question earlier, I mean, of course, if you look at all the states in the ground state manifold for one of those samples, how are they related to each other? They are related to each other by overturning some clusters of spins, which can be overturned at zero energy cost. Um, and so you can identify such clusters. So you, so you look at all the states in the ground state manifold, and then some spins, and those are the spins uh, in, in, in this big green cluster here, they're always in the same relative orientation. I mean, they can be all, you know, completely flipped over, but they're in the same relative orientation. And then uh, you have certain clusters which are overturned one, one at a time to generate the other ground states in the ground state manifold. And, um, so uh, that is described here. So one thing we need to do is we need to identify all these clusters uh, to be able to sample the ground state manifold properly. Interestingly, the, at least numerically, it seems like, uh, you know, apart from this uh, kind of anomaly at small cluster sizes, so that's a histogram of the sizes of, of those clusters, they seem to follow roughly a power law scaling with a power of minus two. Um, Okay, and then we do some kind of Monte Carlo simulation in these cluster variables. Uh, so it's a parallel tempering cluster exchange type of Monte Carlo simulation to give us kind of uh, uniform sampling. Um, and so, so this is what was shown here. So the, you know, the algorithm after doing all these tricks uh, seems to give, I mean, we, do, we did many more tests, of course, seems to give uniform sampling. Okay, then we can study the, uh, the behavior of the, of, of the bimodal model, of course, the the average energy, that is not affected because that's the same for all the ground states, so you don't need that sampling algorithm. We can look at it also, the behavior of the, uh, of the stiffness or of the uh, defect energy, you know, the settling down to constant value, implying in that sense uh, that theta is zero. That is unaffected, but uh, what is affected by, um, uh, you know, looking at the individual ground states separately is the question of the length of the domain wall because that will be different for each pair of ground states you look at. Now, while for the Gaussian case, the domain wall is easy, straightforward to identify because it's unique. Here for the bimodal case, you can have uh, a few things. You can have kind of excitations, if you want to call them like that, which are uh, detached from the domain wall. Well, because you can overturn certain clusters at zero energy cost, right? So you have to remove those. They are not part of the domain wall. And then also you can have kind of such bubbles attached to the domain wall, right? So uh, that means that the length of the, of the domain wall is not uniquely defined in that sense. So you have to uh, ask yourself, should I remove all of those bubbles? Should I include them? So there are different definitions of the, of the domain wall for the bimodal case. And so we, we carry through two extreme cases, kind of the short domain wall and the long domain wall, where one includes all the bubbles and the other one doesn't include. And we, of course, we hope to find the same scaling in the end. And uh, so to make a long story short, that's indeed uh, how it looks like. So there are, uh, you know, there are compatible fractal dimensions for these two definitions of the domain walls. So interestingly, if you look at, you know, at the, at the result at the scale of, of the full range of system sizes, you don't see a difference even between, you know, this quite elaborate algorithm and the algorithm that I mentioned first that gives this extremely non-uniform uh, sampling. But once you zoom in, you see that there are huge differences which affect uh, uh, the uh, fractal dimension. Okay, so this is shown here. So that's the ratio of the long and the short definition which goes to a constant. So we are satisfied that they show the same behavior. So far regarding the, uh, the 2D model, Gaussian versus bimodal specifically, and now let me say something a little bit more generally. Uh, generally so, uh, you know, we have this one case where everything is highly degenerate, the other case where everything uh, 
is unique, I mean the ground states uh, are unique, could we somehow interpolate between these two extreme cases to connect them in a continuous family of models? Could we have something with, with tunable degeneracy? Well, there are different ways of doing that, of course. One obvious way is to, to, to have a modal type of disorder, but to put several copies of, of such bonds onto each uh, edge on the lattice. So let's say we have four copies, four layers, whatever you want to call them, on each, and then you could have, and, and you add them up, and then you could have uh, values like this. So this is like um, uh, essentially adding uh, binomial variables to each other. And we know, of course, that um, you know, if you rescale properly, uh, this gives us something that approaches uh, a Gaussian distribution uh, in the limit of having many of those layers, right? So we have a, a continuous interpolation uh, between a bimodal model and, uh, and the Gaussian model. So let's see how that behaves. Uh, so this is just shown here. So it behaves like, a, I mean, the probability distribution of the coupling is that of a binomial variable. So how does that behave in terms of degeneracies? Uh, one can show uh, rigorously that there's a bound to the, um, to the entropy of each of those energy levels, um, uh, which has a scaling form like this. And in particular, that means uh, that as you send m to infinity, which is kind of that continuous limit, you have a unique ground state. That's what we know, of course, intuitively in the Gaussian model. There are no degeneracies. But interestingly, uh, if you take a limit uh, that is kind of correlated, so if you take a limit uh, where you send n to infinity and you send m to infinity such that n div divided by square root of m is fixed, then you can actually generate something which has uh, a certain pre-described uh, amount of degeneracy. So that's uh, an interesting example where one sees that uh, you know, everything depends on the order of taking those limits. Now let's look at um, the actual behavior of these level entropies for the case of the ground state. So I, I mean, I didn't mention that, but there are other ways, exact algorithms, to actually determine the density of states of spin glasses in two dimensions. So that's some kind of mapping onto uh, essentially Pfeffians. Uh, very similar to what you do for the uh, Ising ferromagnet. Um, and by using these methods, we can get exact ground state entropies for, for, the, for this problem in two dimensions. Again, I mean, the, uh, this interpolation is, of course, uh, general. It works in, in, in any dimension. But in two dimensions, we can look at what are these ground state entropies and how do they scale with M. And in fact, we find, I mean, this was just a bound, of course, but uh, we find that the actual entropies, they very well follow the functional form indicated by the bound. And we can determine uh, kind of this uh, uh, scaling amplitude here quite, quite accurately. And then one, uh, you know, another question you might ask is now, how does that interpolation work in terms of these kind of inconsistent behaviors? We, I mean, you know, you have theta minus 0.3 approximately for the Gaussian case. You have theta equal to 0 for the, for the bimodal case. How do I go from one case to the other? So let's look at how the defect energies behave for different values of m. Uh, and you see, OK, if, if m is, is kind of uh, very large, then you have uh, that Gaussian behavior. You approach the Gaussian behavior, which is shown here by the solid black line. But if it gets smaller, you approach something that uh, settles down. So there seems to be some kind of continuous interpolation. So you could, if you wanted, for a fixed uh, range of system sizes, like it's shown here, you could uh, give effective uh, stiffness exponents uh, for different values of m. And then you would have something like this. So somehow you, you seem to interpolate between um, kind of uh, m is, uh, sorry, theta is 0 for m equals 1, and theta goes to about minus 0.3 for m going to infinity. But presumably, uh, if, I, if I made a poll here in terms of whether you know, this exponent continuously depends on m, probably there would be a majority saying, no, no, I mean, that can't be the case. Uh, and of course, uh, that's, that's also so. So this is just an effective exponent. And so you can uh, easily see that there must be some kind of crossover length scale such that um, the system behavior crosses over from a situation where you see uh, where you don't see the, dis uh, the, the, the discreteness of the spectrum to a situation where you see the discreteness of the spectrum. Um, so the model appears uh, continuous for, on small length scales, and then uh, you see that it's discrete on sufficiently large length scales, and that length scale goes approximately like m squared. So, and, and the data follow this type of behavior quite well in terms of a scaling plot. So that kind of brings me to the 
uh, conclusion. So, uh, you know, in the one part of the study, we, uh, we managed using essentially just pimped up versions of the existing algorithms for uh, ground state calculations. We were able to look at much larger system sizes than were studied before for the 2D um, model. And uh, so we have now some quite accurate uh, values for the stiffness exponent and also for the fractal dimension of the Gaussian case. And then also combining that with extra machinery for the case of bimodal couplings, we can sample the degenerate states uniformly and find uh, stiffnesses, stiffness expo uh, sorry, uh, fractal dimensions, uh, which are at least very close and just about compatible. So, um, uh, I mean, here the, I should say the accuracy of these results is much less than for the Gaussian case because we still need to do this post-processing of sampling all the ground states. Uh, uh, uniformly, but I mean this is f significantly uh, far away from uh, from previous estimates. And finally, uh, there doesn't seem to be consistent uh, uh, consistency with that conjectured relation between the fractal dimension and the uh, and the stiffness exponent. And then f for this other model, um, uh, you know, I invite people to if. Uh, if they have ideas or if you have ideas for how else this model could be useful uh, as an interpolation between the continuous and the discrete um, to, to let me know. But for now, uh, I think we at least understand how that interpolation works in terms of the stiffness exponents that you can think of it as some kind of crossover between discrete spectrum and continuous spectrum, which I think could be potentially quite interesting for, for studies of spin glasses more generally. So, and with that, I thank you very much. And I think there's time for questions. Thank you. Oh. Questions? So you showed the um, phase diagram with the ferromagnet and the spin glass phase. So there's a transition to zero, zero temperature from the, the ferromagnet to the spin glass. Right. Um, can you say something about that transition? Presumably your method worked for that, right? You don't need it, it, it does work, yeah. We didn't, I mean, people studied it, uh, of course. No, that's right. So that's something that could be done, which we, you know, we haven't done. And uh, so I kind of agree with Peter. That's uh, not a problem not only of computer time, but also of human time. And so it's yeah. a very interesting but, point yeah. because there's a whole line there below the Nishimori point. Yes. It's going to be controlled by the zero temperature fixed point, right? So unlike yes. the Dewey spin glass, where the temperature is controlled by the temperature of the spin glass, you know, any, any temperature relevant takes the that that point is going to be controlled by the Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right. Well, I mean, we, we can't enumerate all the states because there are too many, but at least we can sample them uniformly, and that, that might be, I think, an interesting extension. That's right, yeah. If there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Just a tiny little announcement at, at the very end. Uh, uh, for those of you interested, there will be the conference on computational physics um, will be held in Coventry next year uh, at these dates at the beginning of August. And so uh, please have a look at the, at the website and you know, sign up for it and visit us at Coventry. Thank you. The next part.